ready to hear. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, so we'll start with that there is no reporting out from closed session today. So we will begin with um, calling for an approval of the agenda, please. I make a motion that we approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is passed. It appears that our holiday surprise highlight is not here right now. So um, if everybody is OK, if our band does show up, we'll kind of um, we'll, we'll do a little flipping so that we make sure we, yeah, I know. So anyway, so I just want to share that since they're not here yet. OK. We are going to move on to number nine, which is the annual organizational meeting for the governing board. Um, we'll start with 9.1. Um, I need a motion to ratify for president. I feel like I'm far away from you guys tonight. <laughs> I make a motion. Oh. And I'd like to nominate Diane Ferrucci. Thank you. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. We'll move on to 9.2, ratification of clerk. I'll need a motion. I move that we nominate Stacy Holguin for clerk. And I second. All in favor? Aye. Hearing any opposed? Hearing none, that passes as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to 9.3, which is our calendar. Has everybody had a chance to review the board meeting calendar for 2020? Okay, um, without any comments, we'll kind of take the morning. I'll need a motion to approve the calendar, please. I'll make a motion to approve the calendar for the board meetings for the year 2020. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the calendar is approved. We're going to move on to number 10, which is reports, and we'll get to our students, please. Good evening, school board. Liberty High School would like to thank, thank Patelco Credit Union and all the community members that volunteered for our Buy a Reality event. All the students learned about financial literacy and the importance of budgeting through the interactive simulation. Many students learned how quickly and how important it is to prioritize their spending and pitfalls of debt. It was a great experience. Several Liberty High School students volunteered at the Community Action Council dinner. They assisted setup, serve, and clean up. This is an ongoing tradition and theme at LHS to volunteer and help the community. Our learning through interest program is going very well. We have three students in internships and several more to start in January. I, myself, am planning on starting an internship at January in Sausalito's Marine Mammal Center, where I will be rescuing and getting sick and injured seals back to health with the hopeful release of them back into the ocean. <laughs> to help ease the worry of next week's finals, we are planning fun activities for the entire school. We are having a door decorating contest, baking sugar cookies, holiday stocking decorating, and our annual holiday dinner with our mentors. On behalf of Liberty High School, we wish everyone a wonderful winter break. Thank awesome, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Okay. Good evening. I'm Maddie Brinkin, the ASB Vice President. So this week is Wellness Week. Wellness Week is a week for our students to de-stress and to provide a relaxing environment for our student body before final starts. So our student, our students have been uh, participating in lunchtime events such as like cocoa and coloring books, tea time sessions, and many more. Tomorrow we have a sweater contest. And next week will be our finals, which is why we have wellness week. Tonight was the last improv show of the semester, and Almost Main is showing for the second weekend for the second weekend this weekend, Friday and Saturday at seven and Sunday at twelve. It's twelve dollars for general and eight dollars for students. Student staff and student staff variety show signups are being collected this week and possibly next week as well. The past events that are going on at our school was we had a student forum during access last Thursday, and our main topic was lockers and what we can do to improve them. On Tuesday, there was a school site council meeting. And yesterday, Mr. Starkweather, our AP psychology teacher, provided a special event about adolescents and the teenage brain, which gave more insight on why teens drive their parents crazy. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, with that said, I'd like to move on to 10.2 to the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, trustees, and everybody who could join us this evening. Um, I just want to make a couple comments about something that I think that we continue to get better and better at as a school district. And that, and you guys have heard me talk about that before, it's culture. Um, and what is the culture of the school district? And the culture is our, our deeply held beliefs and the ways that we want to do the work together on behalf of our students. Um, and in partnership over the last several years, we've had some real positive movements in the area of continuing to shape the culture of this district to make it a really wonderful place for certainly people to work and for kids to learn. And I wanted to just point out a few of them. <clears throat> One of the ones that we did together as a team several years ago is we came together with a very complex process to change the bell schedule at the high school. Um, sounds like a simple thing. It, it wasn't. It isn't. Uh, but that was a big deal. And that was a very close partnership, um, certainly with parents weighing in. We had a very sort of an academic process that we went through, but a deep partnership with uh, management and teachers to look at the research and to take a look at the best way to organize this uh, bell schedule for kids. We didn't get everything we wanted, but that was significant change and it continues to make a positive difference in the lives of kids and staff. That was a big deal. Another positive uh, culture shaper for us was negotiations last year. Uh, that was a, um, a marked departure from the way that we had done it here for many, 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 many years, not unlike most districts. And then prior to last year, uh, I refer to it sort of as a crucible. Uh, we went through our own crucible. This is tough. Uh, and, we and we came out of that um, in partnership in both sides, reflecting on a way to do that better, that we wanted the negotiations process to line up with the other great work that we do in the district. And certainly we're very hopeful and very mindful of being able to mirror that process again. I'm not sure if we can get it done in an hour. Maybe we can. Uh, but, but that's what we did. And that's a, that's a culture shaper. That, that's a very positive effect on the system. That led to um, these monthly meetings with site reps, which is you know, pretty common practice. But we immediately put that in place as an opportunity for me to meet with the site reps monthly. And that's been very helpful to, to stay in the know, uh, to be open and to listen to the things that are going out at school sites. Another thing that came out of this process um, it continues to build culture is the El Capitans. It's kind of a big deal. I was talking to the union president, Ms. Field, uh, who uh, meets with other union presidents in, in other districts. And when she describes the process that we use in the development of our uh, LCAP process, which is a close partnership between management and teachers uh, and the development of priorities and expenditures, um, that's a very robust and, and, and helpful process. And that's an, uh, another positive culture builder because it represents partnership. A couple other quick ones. Uh, we've worked on changing the teacher evaluation system, and I think we're still working our way through that, but that also represents a partnership and taking a look at a different way to reflect on the way teachers do their work. And another more recent one, and this sort of came out of conversations in the monthly site meetings, uh, areas in the, within our district that need um, more focus, and these come up periodically. One of them is in the area of special education. We offer a very good program, uh, but there are areas that we wanted to think about further, and so we put together a special ed task force uh, with um, Julie Corona, our new director of special ed, and that, that task force has met twice, and they're making terrific progress that will inform the system in good ways going forward. So I say all those things, and I'm going to keep saying them, um, because it's our responsibility, as long as we're all in the system, to shape the culture with intention. Because organizations will take on their own culture, whether or not you pay attention to it. So I know we all want it to be good. I know we want it to be positive. So we'll, we'll continue to get after that with, with, um, with intention. We appreciate the work of the teachers union. I think we're making really good progress with one another. Um, in closing, talking about partnerships, we have some nice partnerships with the city. Uh, we continue to work very well with them across the board. A couple of the new ones are these safety videos that we put together uh, with the chief of the fire department, chief of the police department, and yours truly uh, about safety and how we respond to safety. And we'll be making safety issues. We'll make a series of other videos and getting those out to the public. So we appreciate that partnership uh, as well. And then the last one 
this uh, really kind of an exciting effort, and it came out of the work from Dr. Beetson in the block grant and working with staff about how to continue to affect our students' reading scores. Because you've heard me talk about, and certainly Dr. Beetson and I, about kids needing to be at or above grade level by the third grade, and what an important indicator that is. So one of the things uh, we came up with in brainstorming is having this partnership with the city called Benicia Reads. Uh, and that has really taken on um, some real energy. We have a, a logo for it, and th there's many committees that are working to, to put that together. And that's a cultural dynamic for the city, where people would say, what, what is that town about? When I first started here, people talked a lot about this town having fine arts, and, and, and you know, that's an art town. So that's a cultural element. So our thought is, can this reading piece be part of that cultural fabric of this town where there's this heavy emphasis on literacy? So we're excited about that partnership as well. So I know we have the board meeting ahead of us, but uh, just wanted to wish everybody happy holiday season. And because uh, we don't say these things at the end of the meeting and happy, happy holiday season to the trustees. And, and uh, this, the state of the district's in good shape. We're, we're, we're doing good work and moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and what about some board reports? We were all very busy this last week or two. Um, yes, and I'll, I'll share very briefly. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the California School Boards Association uh, conference for the first time. Um, a lot of great information. Um, I attended several different sessions. Um, one of the sessions that I did attend um, was on around equity, so equity in action. Um, and so there were a couple of county offices who actually participated together and then a couple of school districts. Actually, it was Napa County, Los Angeles County Office of Ed, San Diego, San Diego County Office of Ed, and then for school districts, it was Pittsburgh, Fresno, Linwood, and Compton. And so what they did was they, they basically developed this professional learning network where they really looked at their student populations to see what they could do to really best serve all of their students. And so um, it was really to look at or to identify root causes of inequities. inequities. And so um, it was really, like I said, it was a really good session. Um, they shared a lot of great information. And I did pick up copies for, for all of the members. So. And I have a couple of extra if any of you guys want to see it, too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Ada? I, I attended the same conference and I learned a lot more information. So it was really a great conference. It was a good time to um, meet with, you know, meet and network with other um, districts throughout California. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and I also, while I have the microphone, I just want to say um, happy holidays to all our um, school district and Benicia in general. Um, it's, we're moving into 2020, and may everybody have a good one. So that's it. You need to get ready your cold. Yeah, really. <laughs> I uh, also was able to go to the conference and saw some, went to some really good uh, of the classes. One was on tech addiction and kids and their inability to, and adults, stop looking at their phones mm -hmm. and the various games. And it was really enlightening. To, uh, they discussed the certain apps and how uh, these companies have tons of behavioral scientists that work to design these apps and games so that you will not put it down, so that you can't possibly think about it. And thinking about our kids versus the horde of people that are making games to addict them, uh, it was very eye-opening. And uh, the things that districts are going through... Um, one of the people that was doing the discussion was from Mount Diablo. She was a special ed director over there. She said their home and hospital kids are spiking because parents cannot seem to get their kids to get off screens at home and even to go to school. This video game addiction is gigantic and just uh, things that you really have to look at doing. There's pushes even from the state level to suggest uh, restricting and limiting the use of phones and uh, of all the sessions I went to down there that one was the most packed and the most contentious uh, there were some other good ones I'm managing uh, uh, stressful situations in terms of uh, with the public there was San Luis Obispo had an issue that uh, divided the town with one of the high school teachers and how the Principal definitely uh, tiptoed and what he did to put together groups to bring in community input. And I just, I was so impressed by the guy. 
And I'm walking out with Charles and him and Charles know each other. They're, and I had to tell the guy, look, I, you were really impressive because when you have the town divided, it could go either way. And you're going to end up having one group really mad at you. But this gentleman, I don't remember his Eric name. Prater. Eric Prater. He just, the way he did it, really uh, it brought everyone together. And it was a situation that could have really torn everything apart. Con yes, mm -hmm. the uh, community group he brought together was called Common Ground, and he purposely made it out of people from all varying viewpoints. He said the first year, basically, he came in and he just got yelled at. Everyone would yell at him, and then he'd just sit there. And then, as by now the third year, they actually talk well and do well. So it was just—I didn't mean to take up so much time, but it was really—it was neat. This, the sessions I was able to go to. Thank you. I'll say so real quickly, I think we all went to the conference and it really was an amazing learning experience down there this year. The, the sessions I think were timely as well as being real rich with information. Actually one of the sessions or two of the ones that I went to um, had to do with special ed and inclusion since that seemed to be an area of concern. I really felt like like we need to get a really good grasp on exactly what it is so that we can in fact be a support when the time is necessary. So they were very well done. And um, one of the districts that was leading that was, in fact, was Napa. So Napa is also there. You know, they've got some other resources in doing some big work. But I felt like I needed that. That was that was something that was coming in as I was phasing out of education. So needed to understand it. The other thing I did, too, is I went to the Valero yearly CAP meeting. This is the meeting where everybody gets to go. It's an open meeting. I guess people can go to any meeting. But they particularly try to get people from all over. And again, the website, um, in case anyone is trying to find out what is going on at the CAP, is the Benicia CAP. Ref the Benicia Refinery CAP website. You can just go on and you will see all of the agendas, you'll see all of the meeting notes, you'll catch all of the presentations and any of the reports, in fact, that are going out. So if you have any interest in doing that, um, you can put that, you can get up on that website. Also, just a couple of quick announcements. I hit Matthew Turner this week. Um, and it was really kind of funny. You know, it's like I've not been at working at a school site for a long time. I get caught in a fire drill. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. But what was really good about it is um, it was fun to see that the Benicia Fire Department was there. There were actually three firefighters there. And um, they we talked for a little bit afterwards. And, you know, they're, they're making an effort to get out to the sites and to be there for the fire drills. And... I think that's so great, and I really appreciate that partnership. I know we've been talking about it and wanting to strengthen it, so I thought that was um, just a real nice plus, and I made sure to thank them for being there. So I, it was great, and the kids were awesome. So the fire drills in Benicia are pretty impressive for the most part. And then another quick announcement is I ran into um, a parent tonight at the fundraiser that I was at, and she wanted me to remind everybody, and Mrs. Ada, I can't remember, did you remind us about Henderson's fundraiser last one, or was it um, the middle school? Was it the Shamrocks and shan Shenanigans you did? That was last year. Okay, but you reminded us of one last year. Anyways, Robert Semple is having one, and it's in conjunction with grad night this year. And it's going to be at March 6th, and it's at the clock tower. So there are several. We are starting this this journey, so get ready. So March 6th is, is Robert Semple, and it's in the grad night at March. And then the middle school is Shenanigan, Shamrocks and Shenanigans, and that. Is that right? Yes, Carol is shaking her head. Yes, and that should be around St. Patrick's Day time is what, yes, because you only get green drinks. So uh, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Start filling up your calendar because our schools are getting busy and they'll be reaching out and, and hoping to get community involvement. So that does it for board. Oh, the S back. Okay, so... Um, just one more thing I want to remind us of is um, 
This is from Dr. Beetson's report. This is now that more of our data is coming through with our SBAC scores, and the SBAC is the opportunity for the state to compile all of the test data and to report it out. And what we were very excited about is to notice all the areas of improvement for Benicia. We were up in English, we were up in math, and we were up in college and career readiness. So that was pretty impressive. So yay, Benicia, which means thank you, teachers. Thank you, kids. You did an awesome job. So her Ray for you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to 11, which is comments from the public. Uh, members of the public may address the board at a regular meeting on, oh, I'm sorry, ladies, thank you very much. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, members of the board may address the public at a regular meeting on any item within the board's jurisdiction. Cards may be completed requesting to address the board. They are available at the back table and may be submitted to the board secretary at the meeting. The governing board allows speakers to speak at regular meetings on agendized and not agendized matters under public comment. Comments are limited to no more than three minutes per speaker. By law, no action may be taken on any item raised during the public comment periods, and matters may be referred to staff or placement on a future agenda of the governing board. Right now, I have one speaker, Mr. Zeta. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Young mentioned art and Benicia, and this is what I'm about to talk about. Um, uh, I want to talk about the California Junior Duck Stamp Contest, and that is something done by the Fish and Wildlife Service. I have a um, connection with them. Uh, I don't work with them, actually. I do work for the federal government, not for the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, what they do is they have a, uh, a contest every year uh, for duck stamp contest. It's a junior duck stamp contest, uh, and it's... Um, Kids from kindergarten to 12th grade design a, a drawing, either a duck or a, a, a waterfowl. And I think for our community, we are on the water. We have lots of waterfowl. We have lots of natural habitats. It would be a great idea for our kids um, to participate in this. Um, I do have a handout if for the board. You can read through it. And I have a, also a, uh, a package that they sent me. Um, it's done every year, and the winners go on to the national. And after the national, they choose a hundred of those, and the kids get scholarships. Um, and then they print them on duck stamps, and the duck stamps are are sold throughout the United States for hunting. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a duck stamp. Correct. Then, oh, like okay. Correct. It's like a postage stamp. Okay. There. Um, correct. So every every child that submits a uh, a drawing. Um, gets to gets a you know a participation thing but they also get a calendar with last year's winners it printed on them which is great um, so I know we want to promote art there's a lot of people on our board that really want to promote art so I hope that is something that some of our teachers want to do um, and uh, the person in charge of the fish and wildlife in um, Sacramento is willing to come down talk to teachers talk to students uh, in assemblies to the board um, to for us to participate in and I hope that the board considers that or some of the teachers really want to do that if um, maybe they can come down and talk to a group of teachers and the teachers pass that on to the students um, so I will leave the the package here in case anybody wants to read it and uh, thank you very much I appreciate it okay, thank, thank you. you so just some clarity when when is this contest again it's it's just started. They just sent me the package. So okay, uh, I, I yeah, but and I think the deadline is February first to submit yeah. the, okay. the drawings on that. Okay, um, so what what we can do is we can make sure that staff gets us out to all the schools so that we can make everybody aware. Yeah. So the again, program. they're willing to come down from Sacramento anytime, day or night, to talk to to you know a group of students or uh, teachers or whatever. They're they're willing to do that. Explain how the how it runs and what the rules are and everything else on that. So Thank you. it's a great okay. program, I think, for how us to, to participate. Come, Thank how you. How did you come to know of this? Well, um, we deal with the with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I work for um, <coughs> government printing office here, so we print a lot of stuff for them, and so we actually printed some of their material. Uh -huh. And so I talked <laughs> to them, and I said, "Oh, that'd be really interesting." They said, "Oh, well, here's here's the stuff that we want. That would be great for you guys to participate. We'd love a lot of different schools or just school districts to participate in that. That's something I think kids would really like, and especially where we live and with with what we right. have out here. We'll, we'll get the word out. 
Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for the information. Okay. So we're going to move on to item number 12, which is the consent item calendar, and that's an action item. So I need a motion to approve the consent calendar, please. I move that we uh, approve the consent calendar as written. Okay. I second. I second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent calendar is approved. Okay, we are going to move on to discussion items. And yes, we do. 12.3 is the resolution is obsolete book. So actually, we are going to need a roll call for this one. So roll call vote, please, Mrs. Martinez. Do you need to do first and second? We we have a first and second. Oh, I need you to the general right. one. Okay, so President Ferrucci? Yes. And um, Trustee Amaselli? Yes. Trustee Seda? Yes. And Trustee Moss? Yes. Okay, so now we're going to move into some discussion items. And we are going to move in and out at this point for everyone sitting here is I'm going to close a board meeting. I'm going to open up. Some of you are shaking your head. They've been doing this with me for a few meetings now. Um, we are going to actually have two separate ones tonight as we move into board business. Um, we have um, our attorneys from F3 with us tonight that will be giving a little bit of information. So at this point, I'm closing the board meeting, and I am opening the public board meeting, the public hearing for 13.1. We're convening now a public hearing on the submission of a general waiver request to be approved by the State Board of Education in accordance with Ed Code Sections 33050 dash 33053. Under Ed Code section 33050, the board must hold a public hearing to consider the submission of a waiver request to the State Board of Education to waive all portion or portions of the Education Code. As part of the public hearing, members of the public may submit comments on the proposal to submit a waiver request to the State Board of Education pertaining to the requirements of Ed Code that will change in the district's election system from an at-large election system to a by-trustee area election system to be presented to the electorate of the district. Speakers will be given three minutes to make comments on this matter and this matter only. You have received cards in the back and for anyone wishing to address this meeting. Do we have any cards, Mrs. Martinez? No. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to refer to um, our attorneys and ask them, could you please just give them a little bit more, inf actually all of us, a little more information okay. about the waiver. So as part of the transition from the at-large election system to a by-trustee election system, typically um, the law requires an election to be held after all of the public meetings are held and after the county approves. Um, but as we know, this is kind of a lengthy process and to protect the school district from any liability from the election turning down the transition or from uh, the election just costing the district excess money, that's what this waiver is about. It's not about which map is being chosen, and that's very important. It's about the transition itself. So what the district is doing here is submitting a waiver to the State Board of, Ed State Board of Education, waiving the election itself, um, and the district will now be moving on to the second public hearing, which is about the maps in general. Okay. So are there any comments or questions from the public? Okay. Seeing none, are there any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Seeing that there's none, then this public hearing on the submission of a general waiver to be approved is now closed. Okay. Hang on. I made old-fashioned notes like when I used to teach. <laughs> okay, we are now going to move on to 13.2, which is a public hearing regarding the govern regarding the maps. Um, we're now going to convene a public hearing to receive public testimony concerning proposed trustee voting areas plans associated with the district's transition to a bi-trustee area election system. Under California Election Code 10010, the board must hold at least two public hearings prior to holding a public hearing to adopt a final trustee voting area plan. 
As part of the uh, public hearing, members of the public may submit comments on the establishment of voting area boundaries for the new trustee voting areas that will be established as part of the district's transition from an at-large system to a by-trustee area. Do you want to make some comments now and go through the process with us again? Like, Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll go through the presentation now. Right, go through the presentation and then we'll call for comments. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon Lalonde, and I'm joined by Andrew, who is working with Cooperative Strategies that is acting as the district's demographer in this case. I see some, famili some, some familiar faces here tonight. So um, the purpose of this meeting, and this is the final uh, number three out of three map-related public hearings for the transition uh, from the from the um, at-large election system into the by-trustee area election system. The purpose of this public hearing is to solicit feedback from the community regarding what they like or dislike about the proposed area maps, and then present those area maps to the board for consideration at a later section of the meeting. Before we get into any map specifics, it's important to first talk about what the California Voting Rights Act is. Um, th this is a law that took uh, took effect in 2003, and it prohibits the use of an at-large election system, which is the system that the district currently has, has where um, such an election system impairs the ability of protected classes to nominate candidates of their choice or influence the outcome of an election. And this bar has been surprisingly low in the, um, in the legal, when it has been challenged. So we have recommended that the district Tra uh, transition away from the at-large election system into a by-trustee el area election system because the by-trustee area election system is the only safe harbor from a CVRA claim. And that means that once the district begins its transition, the district can no longer be sued under the CVRA for um, alleged uh, violations. And under a by-trustee area election system, that's where the trustees are now nominated or elected from their own specific trustee areas, and that differs from the at-large election system. Under the at-large election system, each member of the board is elected from every constituent of the district. And now under the by-trustee area election system, once we show the maps, area one will vote for trustee one, area two will vote for trustee two, et cetera. The current stage that the district is in now is the drafting of the map stages. Um, the demographer has used 2010 census data and additionally permitted data to craft these, uh, these maps. And the first consideration is population equality. Each one of the districts has to be nearly equal in population with a variance up to 10% between the largest and smallest districts. And Andrew will speak on that a little bit more. Um, and some other considerations under the Constitution are that it must, each map must comply with the Constitution. Uh, must comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, uh, protect communities of interest, um, the districts must be geographically contiguous, and they cannot favor an incumbent or political candidate of a political party. So last time we we're going to go over the demographics for Benicia Unified. So on the left you see the uh, geographic profile with the cities that are within the Unified School District boundaries. On the right, we have the total population of the school district, and that number comes out to be uh, a little bit over 27,000. If we divide that number by five for each of the five board members, we'll get um, areas that are going to be roughly uh, 5,400 um, people in each area, and we do get a 10% variance. So each area is going to be about a plus or minus 540 people. And then we have the uh, demographic breakdown for the Hispanic Latino community, about 12%. The white population, about 66%. African American at 5.28%. And the next largest demographic group is the Asian population at 10.86%. We also have the population of those who are 18 years and older, and that number comes out to be 20,785. We're really going to be focusing more on the citizens voting age population. So these, this is also known as CVAP for short or your eligible voters uh, for the district. And uh, the total number of eligible voters for the, the district is 21,000. Um, and the demographic breakdown is 12% for the Hispanic Latino community, 
5.16% for African American, and the next largest is the Asian population, just a little over 10%. And on the left side, we have the uh, de density map of the Hispanic Latino population. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is find the concentration of the Latino uh, voters and see if we can make them in their own area, uh, seeing that they're all kind of spread out and dispersed. Uh, we couldn't really get them all in a particular concentration or concentrated area. And when I get to the numbers down, uh, when I'm talking about the scenarios, uh, when, I, when I talk about the um, voting influence uh, being increased, we're talking about the percentages from this table. Uh, so when, when it, each area is created, we're hoping to get um, percentages that are higher than the district average for the um, protected classes. And this is also the same table with a different map. Last time I can make this joke is that the Asian population, um, the, the southern portion is not the Asian population, it's water. So I, I learned my lesson making the same color as the water and the symbology the same. Um, but also very similarly to the um, Latino population that there's no real concentration of the Asian uh, citizens voting age population. And then moving forward, we do have three maps tonight. Um, so we'll go over the symbology and what everything means. So each, uh, so we are using census blocks and we are creating these areas and census blocks are the smallest geographic feature. Um, so we have to follow um, major roads the best we can, but when we can't, sometimes we have to use census blocks as the division line. Um, so sometimes you'll see some more jagged, not clean cut edges and that's just because of the census blocks that we do have to use because they come in all different shapes and sizes and they're kind of the puzzle pieces or Lego blocks that make up the school district. So each area is going to be associated with a color. Trustee area one is yellow, trustee area two is green, area three is red, area four is blue, and trustee area five is purple. Uh, each trustee area is going to be the same color throughout each scenario. And we have the general demographics um, at the bottom left side of the um, presentation and then with the legend with the school site symbology where the um, trustees live as well as uh, the trustee colors and you'll notice the colors are also associated with the year. That year represents when that area becomes available for the next election and that is um, based on the trustees uh, term year. Um, so now I'm going to attempt to explain each area. So trustee area one in yellow uh, following the second street all the way south to first street where you get the divide between military east and military west. Um, area two in green is following the 780 highway. And uh, I call the parks the three great parks of Benicia. So Highland Park is in area three um, and the southern community of, of Highland Park, uh, trustee area four in blue is taking the Southampton Park as part of the community as well as the Benicia Middle School. And area five is uh, taking Skillman Park and everything north of uh, Skillman Park as the fifth area. So this brings us to the numbers for the first scenario. Uh, so when we're talking about the increased influence, um, the green bubbles that you see around the numbers, that just means that uh, those numbers are higher than the district average. And just to refresh everybody's memory, the Hispanic Latino community, uh, the district average is 12%. Uh, African American is 5.16%. Uh, and the Asian population is about 10%. So we got two areas of increased influence for the Hispanic Latino community, two areas for the African American community, and two areas for the um, Asian community. And the Asian community in this scenario is the highest out of the three, um, almost 19% in area five. And that brings us to the second scenario. Uh, this time, uh, area one in yellow, it's uh, following the 680 uh, around to the 780 and part of Military West, um, taking in the Liberty High School and uh, Simple Elementary School as part of the first area, the green area, area two, also following the uh, 780 highway a freeway and taking the uh, part of the Hampton Bay community, area three in red, taking the Highland Park community 
as part of that area. Um, area four in blue, Skillman Park um, as part of the blue area, as well as the Benicia Middle School, and area five uh, taking, following the other side of the 680 and uh, the Southampton Park and everything north of that as a fifth area. Now there was a comment, oh, actually we'll jump the gun there. Um, so th these are the numbers. Um, you get one area of increased influence for the Hispanic Latino. This is the highest out of the three scenarios for that demographic group being 15%, which is about a uh, 3% increase for that demographic group. Uh, three areas as opposed to two areas uh, from the previous scenario for the African-American population and then two, three areas as opposed to two areas for the Asian population for this uh, scenario. Now there was a comment in the last uh, public hearing where somebody had asked if we can just combine Carlisle Way into the fourth area and we did uh, take a look at it and see if it was possible. So you have um, one census block on the left side and then uh, another census block on the right side. So when we're combining Carlisle Way, um, so Carlisle Way, the, the um, census block that is highlighted, you have uh, uh, houses that are inside the road. Uh, so when you add that one census block, it doesn't affect the variance as much. But when you take into consideration the rest of Carlisle Way, which is the, the second uh, census block that you see is taking a larger portion of um, the population in that area of uh, Southampton uh, Park. So uh, with the two census blocks being combined, the variance was over um, what the 10% requirement was. So we weren't able to simply combine uh, all of Carlisle Way into uh, just the area four, the blue area. And this leads us to the last scenario. Um, so scenario three, probably the most different out of the two, um, taking the most northern part of the school district following uh, 2nd Street all the way down to the military east um, area. So the whole military street is divided into three areas as opposed to two areas from the last two scenarios. Uh, so the yellow area taking the most eastern side uh, the green, green area taking the middle side and the red area taking the western side of military. And um, again, area four, uh, taking Highland Park as part of the community as well as the Benicia Community Park, more northern or so south of the Lake Herman. And then uh, area five, taking Skillman and Southampton Park as part of the second community as well as Waters End and part of that community. And the numbers for this is one area of increased influence for the Hispanic Latino community, uh, two areas for African American, and uh, also again, two areas for the Asian uh, community of increased influence for this scenario. So now I'm gonna turn, turn it over to Brandon again. So as you can see, we've now finished our pre-map public hearings that were held on the 19th of September and the 3rd of October. And we have now finished all three of our map-related public hearings that were held on November 7th, November 21st, and now today, December 12th. Um, this is essentially going to complete uh, all public hearings on the district's end, and the next step will be submitting to the county. Okay. Thank you. And for um, discussion ideas for public comment, uh, what maps do you like the best? What elements of the maps do you like or not like? These are all things that the board could consider. Okay, so Mr. Zadie, can you come up to the oh, podium sorry. and speak into the mic? The question concerning that, uh, on the earlier one, it said you have to consider the entire population, not just citizens. But when I see some of the things, it says voting age or citizens. So doesn't that, isn't that opposite what it's actually requiring? So when we're dividing the actual area, we have to use the total population. But when we're looking at increasing the influence, we're looking at the uh, citizens voting age population because that is the demographic group that is eligible to vote. Right, so the, the census is used, to, and that's the, the count of every nose in the district, um, to actually divide, and then he is just highlighting the um, influence with the CVAP data. Okay, thank you. Are there any others? Speakers that would like to come forward at this time and make any comments? Are we contemplating? 
<laughs> okay, do it again, Mark. Fine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Ruark. I'm a Benicia resident, also a Benicia teacher at Mary Farmer Elementary School. Um, well, as you know, I don't like scenario two because of Carlisle Way. I just want to go on record for that. Um, so I'm going to just tell you what I think. Uh, scenario one is exactly kind of how I pictured it would be based on the like main roads. And I think that's easy, but I like scenario three the best because it kind of mix up Benicia a little bit and you get different neighborhoods. Oh. And I think that you would get a different, um, kind of like a different demographic than we're used to. Um, cause like I said, scenario one is very straight cut. Like, yeah, that's exactly how I pictured it being. Um, but I, I do, I'm leaning, like, I'm hoping you guys leaning to scenario three, because like I said, I think you'd get different voices together in different groupings. And I think that would spark, um, I think, I think it would be good, like to, you know, I'm thinking about like for looking for candidates that I think it'd have, um, different, different demographics than I'd expect. And I, I'd like that. I like kind of mixing it up. Just my two cents. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Okay, then at this time, I'm going to say thank you for your comments. And the public hearing that received testimony as proposed leaning is now closed. Okay. So now we're going to move into action items, which is 14.1. Um, and the first item we're going to take up for action is the resolution 19-20-07, and it's going to be to authorize the submission of a general waiver request to be approved by the State Board of Education concerning the district's transition to a bi-trustee area election system following the opening and closing from our public hearing. So now is our time to decide to talk about that. So are there any comments from our trustees regarding the waiver? Any questions? Okay, so then at this point, I think what I'm going to ask is a motion to adopt the waiver. And we need to put the resolution number in our motion. I move that we adopt resolution 1920-07, authorizing the submission of the general waiver request. Do I have a second? Okay, this is a resolution, so Mrs. Martinez, please take roll call. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move into 14.2, which is our our final trustee voting our approval of our plan. So before we begin that, as you know, the district previously, previously initiated a transition from an at-large election process to a bi-trustee area election system. Part of the process to complete this transition includes the selection and adoption of a final trustee area plan. In advance of adopting a final plan, the district was required to, and did, seek public input on the proposed trustee area plans. In addition to tonight's public hearing, prior to the release of draft map options, the district held public hearings on September 19, 2019 and October 3, 2019, to solicit feedback in advance of map preparation by the district's demographer in the community. Following the release of a draft map, map options, the district previously held public hearings at governing board meetings on November 7th, 2019, November 21st, and today, December 12th. At today's meeting, the governing board will consider and vote to adopt a resolution and select a final trustee area plan. The matter will now be put before the governing board to adopt a proposed solution and a select a final trustee plan. So members of the board, we are now open to matter up for initial discussion and comments regarding the proposed areas. Do we have any comments that we'd like to make or any ideas regarding which plan? I uh, am a fan initially, as was said by Laura, that map one seemed the most evenly divided up and along the appropriate lines. I had two added, you know, aspects also. And uh, I just, for per perception's sake, I liked one the best. It seems like there was no trying to divide up. And, you know, I'm not going to use the word gerrymander or anything, but there's no trying to divide in a way that looks like we're trying to break up certain areas. So out of the three, I uh, liked one the best. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I also um, 
was leaning towards one. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> um, I, I really looked at these numbers um, a lot, and I looked at these maps a lot, and I feel that it um, it followed the main roads like Laura had brought out. Um, it wasn't cookie cut in a in a we weird way. Um, the numbers of the population were very well distributed. Um, I also feel, I mean, you have to, when the maps came out originally, this was, this is a hard thing for us to have gone through. Um, when the maps originally came out, um, we've got these stars on the maps giving you where we all are. And you have to imagine that they're not there because it has nothing to do with, mm -hmm. not at least how I'm, uh, looking at this. It's, it has nothing to do with it. It also has nothing to do with what schools are in with within each district. Because as a board, um, and I'll, I'll speak for all of us, is that we're all, um, we're all, sorry, we're all for all the schools in Benicia, not just because number one is in, that school is in number one. It has nothing to do with it. Um, so I, I think that that number two, I, I was going back and forth, and I don't, like you said, gerrymandered, you did say it, so, <laughs> but um, I, I, I feel like we looked like we were making it so that all our current incumbents were fitting in the puzzle pieces as is, and I, I didn't feel comfortable with that, so that's my two cents. Thank you. And then for me, I'm leaning towards um, map one just because, uh, you know, looking at the numbers, looking at the population, looking how it's really clearly kind of identified for me, I think that makes it um, very clear. Um, map number two, I was also kind of considering that one as well. Um, but from my preference, I'm, I'm really leaning towards map number one. Okay, so for my two cents, um, I actually am vacillating between one and two. The reason I picked, was looking at two was because I think of the balance. That was the number balance was looking. But then when I start looking at the map, um, especially if it, after it was brought up about dividing a neighborhood, I started to look more closely at it. And then I realized how many neighborhoods we were dividing up um, in order to create that balance. The other thing I was uncomfortable with with two, and just to um, emphasize what Mrs. Ada just said, we were so clear when we began this process that it was not about A, being tied to a school, and it was not about B, trying to protect our, our, our area or our seat. And I think, I think that's what happens in two. Inadvertently, it's what happens in two. Though it was never our intention and it was never our goal. So, um, so I started looking at one a little more closely. I didn't like three. Um, but I started looking at one a little more closely. And there's still a couple of areas that there's like two streets that are really like, you got them split, but I get why you can't do that. But it is a little more clean and it's more natural in the break. Um, I like that we're using, you know, main roads and freeway divides instead of just picking a random path or zigzag along along a hill or a break. So, you know, I too am leaning towards um, a lot number one. So. And Laura, you know, you, <laughs> your your point is well taken on number three, um, where there's a little bit more of a mixture. Um, I completely hear what you're saying, but I think um, I think I don't know. I there was a thought. I had a thought, and it just kind of went. So I blame my cold, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was really a good thought. Darn it! Um, I never mind. It's gone. <laughs> never mind. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so are there any other comments or questions for for us, for each of us, where we need some clarification? No. Okay, are there any other comments or questions for anyone? You're like, okay, no, just do this, huh? <laughs> I was going to say, the thought uh, came back. Okay, back, here we go. We have to revisit this in 2020 <laughs> after the census anyway. Right. So if anything has changed or we get hear comments or whatever, this can be revisited and it's going to be looked at again. So it's not like it's not.
permanent, permanent. It's semi. It's permanent, but semi. You know, not in concrete. Yeah, we can, there we you can, go. We could change. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Zeta, I just had a quick question that I know you've been uh, married to Mr. Zeta for a long time. Was there like a signal there to have him get the, the idea to come back? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he's really telepathic though. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Okay, so do we have any comments or questions? Then no more comments. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do before we pull for a motion, um, we need to make sure that we say the motion, the um, resolution number, but there is a little script that we all have, and it has to be read in its entirety because what it will do is the, the um, map that we choose will also announce in the resolution the areas that will be up for um, election in November 20, especially the areas where there is no current sitting trustee, clearly that's going to need a trustee. Um, and so, can we please get a motion? Um, I would like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 19-20-08 for approval with map scenario number one as the district's adopted trustee area scenario with trustee areas two and three scheduled for real for election in November 2020 and trustee areas one, four, and five scheduled for election in November 2022. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second that resolution. Okay. For all the okay, so we can't we have to do this by roll call. Roll call. So roll call please. Yes. 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 All right, so trustee area map one is adopted and approved. So yes, we are done with this. Thank oh, thank yes, you so thank, you. thank you very much thank you very for much. hanging in there with us. So yes. So just to clarify for everybody, though, the trustee areas that Mrs. Zeta mentioned, um, Miss Moss would be up for election in 2020 anyway, so that's a natural. And the other one that's coming up is because there is no trustee. Um, Mrs. Ho Dr. Hoagleen, who also would be up at 2020, will not be able to run at that time because we now share an area. So just so you're clear why what's happening with that map. Okay. So with that, we are done. We have an area. Mrs. Martinez, did you get the information you need to fill in the blanks there? Can I, can okay. I just uh, congratulate the board and everybody who weighed in on this and our, our support? This was kind of a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, we got after it at the beginning of the year and thought, wow, what, what's this going to look like? But I think it's gone really, really well. And um, Ms. Martinez is quite helpful through all of this, as was Mr. Rahill. So good good job, trustees, and everybody who weighed in and gave us your helpful feedback and our council and our demographer. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, with that said, we're going to move on to board business. Wow. 14.3, the governing board review and approval of the 2019-2021 interim financial report for Benicia Unified School District. Yeah, thank you. Um, as we get the pie charts up on the screen, uh, we'll talk through um, our first interim financial report for the school district. And um, as we do it each year, we have our first interim now, and then we come back with our second interim um, in the early part of next year. And we have our budgeted revenues on our first um, slide here. Our budgeted revenues uh, for our school district are right at $48.9 million. And most of those, uh, as we know, come from the state funds we get for our students through the uh, state student funding formula called the Local Control Funding Formula, LCFF. And so we uh, get about 84% of our revenues from the state um, for our attendants who, uh, for our students who uh, attend school. So that's made up of a, of a base amount of about 39 million and then a supplemental amount uh, of about 1.9 million or almost $2 million for students who are um, in our free and reduced meal program, who are English learners or are fo foster or homeless. Um, and towards the bottom of that slide, we remind ourselves in the bottom left-hand corner that um, when the state gives us the uh, funding for our students attending the schools, that 
a chunk of that is paid through our local property taxes, about 41%. And the rest comes from the state's general, general fund budget. So after we uh, look at our revenues uh, on our next slide, we compare that to what we are spending in 1920 at $50.9 million. Um, our expenditures are focused on the salary and benefits of our of our employees who help educate our kids in our schools. And so that's at 85%, which is the state um, average. Um, the remaining 15% is uh, spent on our supplies and services and any capital outlay we might have. So if you compare our revenues and our expenditures, we are at an operating deficit, and that is due to the carryovers uh, funds that uh, carry over into this this year. We did not spend all of our revenues last year, and so we are planning to spend them this year. Um, a big chunk of that has to do with the state one-time grant, and the district adopted um, a multi-year plan uh, to help spend down those funds over several years um, because the, the um, amount was uh, just too much to manage in, in any given single year. Um, after we look at our revenues and expenditures on the third slide, uh, we look at what is projected to be in our fund balance at the end of the school year at $7.4 million. And so that does provide for the state's um, recommended reserve for the 3% designation for any uncertainties we might have. In addition, um, several years ago, the board established a reserve for board policy, um, which adds another 4% or so. And if we add those two together, um, that's the equivalent about, of about one month of payroll for our school district. Um, what's left over are carryovers of the one time in nature. And then we do have some restricted programs, uh, which uh, are mainly made up of um, some Medi-Cal programs, as well as there's some childcare and some donations in the uh, restricted pot. Um, the next slide um, is something that we've included for several years now um, as our retirement systems are uh, um, struggling to meet their investment goals. Um, the retirement systems for our employees have reached out to not only the schools, but the retirees themselves and, and the state of California and uh, asked everyone to contribute more into the retirement systems so that there will be enough funding to pay the pension costs when folks retire. So we've seen um, additional contributions uh, coming from us. We have a couple more years of scheduled increases um, for both systems, um, except at this point in time, uh, it's early, so these, these rates will change somewhat. Um, out in 2021-22, um, the STRS retirement system for teachers and other certificated um, employees, it's actually projected to go down by 0.3%. So we, we will keep our eyes on that. Um, it, you know, there's a couple more years and there's things that will cause that to change. So up until the 2014-15 year, um, school districts really had the retirement costs built into their budgets <coughs> and uh, didn't see these additional costs, but um, we had to, they did shoot up, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, the next slide, uh, we look at the key fiscal factors um, that really drive our budget, some of the big costs and big revenues that come in. Um, we start with known salary costs. Um, our employees are on a salary schedule, and um, each year there are a number that increase um, on that salary schedule. Uh, we will um, update the outer years um, as we become aware of um, actual retirements. And our HR department has sent out um, notifications to all of our employees, as we've done um, in the past. Uh, we provide a, a $1,500 early uh, retiree notification um, amount uh, payable to an employee who, who knows they're going to retire at the end of the school year, but provides us a... Um, Irrever irreversible uh, resignation letter by, um, I think it's January 10th this year. So after the winter break, 
um, folks have a chance to think about whether they're going to retire or not, and if they can come and make that decision to us um, by that by that date in January, what that does is um, not only helps the employee get to that spot of making that very important decision, but it also helps us plan for the future um, if there are staffing adjustments that would need to be made and we have um, known retirements um, that um, can can prevent layoffs if that is if that is something that a district faces. So it's just better um, to have that information earlier rather than later. Um, we also look at some of our other um, expenditures, um, some some minor changes with our other revenues and expenditures that that we watch over time. Um, the other big one is down in number three with our state funding based on our students attending school. Um, Benicia has been um, declining in enrollment, and so if we have less kids, the state provides us less funding. Um, we are happy to report. Um, that this current year in 2019-20, that uh, I guess we're happy to report this because the number last time was a bigger reduction. So when the kids showed up in August and stuck around into September, um, that number was higher as of the original budget. And so now we have some pretty hard numbers and the kids are sticking on the monthly enrollment counts. So what that does is um, that... Um, identifies our reduction. So we are still declining in enrollment, that, those 21 kids. <clears throat> and uh, what you can see is in that middle column, basically um, the state gives you um, a one-year hold harmless. So instead of taking away that uh, 21, of the funding for those 21 kids in the current year, um, they they give you a hold harmless for one year and they make the adjustment in the following year. So without going into too much more detail, the reason why, uh, you know, the 21 reduction in student enrollment is really only, uh, it only hits us by 20 students in the following year is because we multiplied the enrollment by our attendance factor, our ADA rate, which is about 96%. So in 1920, are we, we got penalized for 119 kids, I assume for the hold harmless from the previous year. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, that's why the big loss this year in yeah. terms of the AD. Okay. Thank yeah, you. we had a bitter, bigger student decline in in the prior year in 1819. So that hit us this year. Fortunately, you know, we're only down 21 kids now, so that will hit us less in the outer years. Um Does if it also mean 2021 we're expecting our enrollment to take another big drop, another 82? Yeah. And so as we look at our numbers and we roll the grades forward, um, we are finding um, that our grade levels right now in the, in the lower grades are around 300. Some are more, some are less. Middle school is a little bit more and high school, you know, middle school might be around you know, in the in the low to mid 300s and then the high schools in the mid 300s as far as that. But we're finding that those middle and high school grade levels are are coming down too. as these new grade levels yeah, of 300 up. come. They're moving through our grades and, and we're not. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so but that 2021 number that a reduction of 82 um, in green. That is actually a better number for us this time around, too, because when we made the adjustment this year and we rolled the kids forward, it made the forward years or the outer years a little bit better. Yeah. So um, in Section 4, we just kind of we look at what our LCFF funding is. That first line um, is just informational because that would show you if we were uh, um, stable enrollment. Um, for example, in the 2020-21 year, if we were to get all of the kids um, and did not have a reduction in funding, we'd have $1,196,000. But because at this point we are anticipating 20 less, um, our actual LCFF at this point in time um, is uh, $1,008,000. Um, this is being prepared. So these outer years are being prepared based on the published information that we have right now. And if we scroll down a little bit 
to that. Yeah, just okay. And you can see that right now the cost of living adjustment that we have published for 2020-21 is listed at 3%. And so we've gotten some information that um, at this point in time, it looks like it's going to be lower than that. And we've seen 1.79%. So the governor um, comes out in January with his budget proposal, and that's what we use in this next time in the second interim. So we've kept the 3% in these multi-year projections for now, but um, the information we have outside of the published rate is that it probably will be less than that when uh, as we move forward. So we'll know in um, early to mid-January when we go to the to Sacramento for the budget workshop about what Governor Newsom is going to publish as the uh, COLA for next year. Were you also hearing that, um, because I heard it at the budget meetings that I went to for the reps as well, um, that Governor, Gover I was going to say Governor Brown, Governor Newsom was talking about um, putting one-time monies back in the budget. Were you hearing that as well? I've just, I've heard that that's a possibility. I haven't heard any uh, per student amount. No, I haven't But I've heard just heard that just it's possible. It's part of the conversation again. Mm -hmm. Because that first year that Governor Newsom came on board and gave us his first budget, he did not include uh, any one-time money to schools. Um, and then on the next slide, um, these are multi-year summaries of um, our um, uh, net operating surplus or deficit up at the top. And so we see we are spending down our carryovers in the current year. In the outer years, even though we are um, have declining enrollment, but they, we do get um, A cola. So like I said, in 2021, um, right now, this is based on a 3% COLA, and if that doesn't stick, those outer numbers will be reduced. Mm -hmm. But we um, we did not reduce those with this first interim report. So that'll be um, an important number to uh, look at next time around. And the bottom section shows that we have our state and local reserves as well as our, our carryovers. Um, and the remaining slide, the next slide shows that in just... Uh, Bar, bar chart formation. And um, the very last slide um, shows our history of net operating um, surpluses and deficit as we spin down. It's always our goal to, to uh, try to keep that a stable line, but it doesn't always work out that way depending on when you uh, spend your carryovers. So we just have uh, uh, the other slide that we put up is the PowerPoint. If, if it's available, I can just quickly go through those. Um, it just talks us through the next steps that um, this uh, first interim report is a po positive um, financial certification. We're using the state's uh, school funding formula, local control funding formula, and providing for the state's 3% reserve. Uh, we always remind ourselves um, what the LCFF is. It's how the state funds our public schools for the most part. And for 1920, um, for Benicia, uh, we received $9,155 per student. That's an average amount because they give a little bit different for elementary, middle, and high, right. but on average, mm -hmm. $9,155. It includes that base grant and supplemental. And we here in Benicia... Our student population, about a quarter of them, so one in four, 25% fall in that supplemental um, population of either being part of the free and reduced food program, our English learners, or our foster and homeless youth. Our LCFF is tied to our um, local control accountability plan, the LCAP. And so um, our assistant superintendent, uh, Leslie Beetson, is heading that effort. And we met already reaching out to the school sites and community. So we'll continue to do that um, into the new year. Um, and so after, uh, after the board takes action on the first interim, we forward that to the Solano County Office of Ed and the California Department of Ed um, for their records. And um, we wait to hear from Governor Newsom 
who proposes uh, a state budget as he as the governor does in every January. So this is kind of six months ahead of time. So he gets he gets the budget out there six months ahead of time, so the uh, legislature can look at it and propose um, changes. Um, he'll come back in May with a May revision that they take action on uh, by I think June fifteenth or so, so that they have an adopted budget by their deadline. And so we'll come back with that second interim financial report at um, the March school board meeting. Okay. Right. Anybody have any comments or questions for Tim? Thanks, Tim. I know there's a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, are there any, being this is an action item, are there any comments or questions from the public? Okay, then seeing none, hearing none, I'm going to call for a motion to approve. First. I move that we approve the first interim report as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the, the report is approved. Okay, with that said, we have gotten to the end of our agenda. Yes. Happy awesome job, everyone. Hey, happy holidays. Holiday. Happy holidays, everyone. Have a great break. Hopefully, it's well rested and happy and get healthy, everyone. Good job, ladies. Okay, and hopefully, Mrs. Zeta, Mrs. Zeta gets healthy so that when she comes back, she's well, all, of us. all of us. I know, and our superintendent are down. So, meeting adjourned. Thank you.